This is not going to be the typical top 10 today. I'm going to do something a little different. These are my top 10 disappointing sci-fi reads. It's not that I didn't like these reads. It's just that they didn't live up to the expectations that maybe I had for them. I think I would feel comfortable recommending any of these books to a particular type of reader. But for me and for what I was looking for in the reading experience, it didn't work out. Number 10, this might surprise some of you, is Greg Egan's Perihelion Summer. I'm a huge fan of Greg Egan. This one just didn't work out quite as well. This was his attempt at doing a novella. His short stories are amazing. Go to uh, Axiomatic, Oceanic, and some of his uh, Luminous for a lot of uh, really great short stories. Very philosophical stuff. A lot of physics, quantum physics. This didn't really have much of that. In Perihelion Summer, you have a black hole. It's a portion of the mass of the sun and it's traveling through our solar system. And it's going to come close enough to the Earth, probably, to create some apocalyptic type disasters. This attempts to be character driven. So we have this guy, Matt, and a bunch of his friends. They create this sort of like, I don't know, it's like an oil rig, but it's sort of a, a mesh between an oil rig and a boat. They don't know what the disaster is going to be necessarily. It could have to do with the climate getting really hot in certain places and really cold in other places. So hot that you can't live there, so cold that you can't live there. It could be rising sea levels, ocean levels, so you're not going to be safe on the coasts. We're not sure what's going to happen, but Matt and his buddies, they get together, they build this aqua rig. They call it the Manjet. The Manjet is this cross between sort of like an oil rig and a boat. And it's like the sustainable habitat. They have a means of producing enough food for everybody on board. So we spend a lot of the time in this story. We're trying to get maybe their families on board, have people buy in. Not everybody's buying into the idea that this climate change that's coming because of the black hole is going to be as serious as these guys on Manjet think that it's going to be. It's fun. It's sort of action-y, adventure-y. You're concerned about, are their families going to come aboard? I think the biggest failing in this is when you go into Greg Egan, you assume you're going to get a lot of like really hard science stuff. And there's a little bit of that in this, but the science really comes in terms of how would you create the sustainable habitat? How are you going to keep yourself safe from whatever the unpredictable catastrophes are going to be? You know, the idea is that you're, you're in this man jet and you're out in like the deep, deep water. That's probably the best place that you can be. But there's not a lot of science other than that. We see the black hole. It's very threatening. But then it becomes a bit of a nothing burger in terms of like explaining it and the physics of it too deeply. I know that you're not going to really get to do that in a short novella like this. It attempts to be character driven. The characters really are not that interesting. They're pretty one dimensional. There's a little bit of familial conflict going on. But it really does not live up to the other things that I've read by Greg Egan that I would highly recommend like Diaspora, Shield's Ladder, Incandescence, Dichronauts quarantine and so many others all that you can see reviews of on my channel at number nine is the mountain in the sea by ray naylor this was sent to me by my friend whitney at the secret sauce of storycraft she sent me this and unfortunately another book on the list and i'm actually really grateful because i you know none of these are books that i regret reading i'm glad that i had the experience of reading but sometimes you know they don't become the best reading experience ever but i'm glad that i read them because i was able to talk to whitney about them and then also have my own opinions on them. And they were entertaining. This I was expecting to be more along the lines of Stories of Your Life by Ted Chang. You definitely feel that. Whereas Stories of Your Life, we're talking about trying to communicate with aliens and understand their language and figuring out, you know, really strong linguistic bent. We have that in here too, but it's almost like almost a young adult version of that, which I don't mean it as a knock. I'm just trying to find a better way to articulate that there's levels of maybe elevation in terms of the challenge of the linguistics. It just seems like we get there a little too quickly with this one. It's sort of like comparing Sudoku with that game where you put like the pe a round peg in a round hole and a triangle peg in a triangle hole. And I, I know that sounds terrible what I'm saying about this. It's just how I'm going to articulate it. It just didn't feel as much of a, a of a challenge in, in terms of how quickly they got to start figuring out some of the ways to communicate with the octopus. There are different storylines in here. One that I actually enjoyed was this sentient ship that's out in the ocean. It's a fishing vessel and they have slaves. They have these AI guards that are sort of keeping watch on the slaves to make sure that they're producing and, and, and bringing in the catch of the day or what have you. And then there's a third storyline that I'm not even going to bring up because it wasn't that interesting to me. The main storyline is supposed to be the octopus storyline. 
And it was just a little bit of a letdown for me because I was expecting to get deeper into it. It's clear that the octopus storyline was intended to be the main storyline here and the idea of examining artificial intelligence, human intelligence, non-human intelligence. Unfortunately, this was just a little bit too monster movie-ish for me and didn't give me that deeper examination that I was sort of looking for. Number eight is Gideon the Ninth. This one was recommended to me by uh, the artist formerly known as the booktube goddess, that's Daisy S. Machina. I was, this was like a year or so ago, I was looking to read something that was more of a science fiction fantasy blend, maybe even more on the fantasy side, and she had recommended this, and so I don't want to complain that it wasn't science fiction enough, but that's going to be my complaint. It wasn't science fiction enough, it was too much fantasy. I do love science fiction fantasy, you know, things like Ubik, uh, More Than Human, Lathe of Heaven, they all come to mind. Where this got too fantasy for me was you know, animated skeletons. So in Gideon the Ninth, we have these necromancers that have the ability, you know, to control bones and skeletons of the deceased. It is sort of interesting, if you, especially if you're a fantasy fan, it's also good for, I think, a young adult crowd. We have these houses that serve the emperor or whatever the name of the ultimate being in this universe is. And the series is called the Locked Tomb series, I believe. So in this universe, you have these different houses. It feels very medieval, feudal. They all serve the emperor. They're all necromancers. They're sort of called to this one central location. And the idea is that they're gonna be vying to become the emperor's next lighter. And if you're a lighter, you're sort of granted this immortality and you serve the emperor and help defend him fight for him in whatever wars or conflicts they're involved in. The main character is Gideon. Gideon is from the ninth house and she's basically a slave, but when the opportunity presents itself, she heads out with the heir from this house and her name is, let me get this right, Harrow Hark Nonagesimus. So it's been a while since I've read this and that's a mouthful. So they head off to this sort of contest and basically Harrow Hark is the one with supposedly the brains and has the necromantic abilities and Gideon is the muscle she's sort of foul mouthed she has sort of an interesting personality what is kind of neat about this is the author Tansman Muir takes a lot of risks in the storytelling it is very unique but the one sure way that you're going to lose me in a novel is to put animated skeletons ghouls or other sort of uh creepy crawlers in the book. At number seven is Stars and Bones by Gareth Powell. I really wanted to like this. Previously, I read Powell's uh, Embers of War and the Embers of War trilogy. Pretty good military science fiction, decent space opera, really good action packed. And most likely I would recommend it for those who like sentient spaceships along the lines of sort of Anne Leckie's uh, Ancillary Justice maybe even uh, some shades of Leviathan Wakes in the Expanse series. This I was expecting something along the same lines, but I also know this had a reputation for some horror element, and I wanted to try that out. And Gareth Powell had appeared on my top 210 science fiction books video and did a cameo for me there. He did one or two, it's been too long ago, I can't remember, and was really generous to do that and came on and spoke about uh, some books for me. And we had a really nice interview, I so I was really eager to pick this up and dive into it. It was a new release at the time. I was glad I was able to do a video on this and talk about the things I liked about it. Uh, as far as it being a disappointment, it wasn't that it wasn't a decent book. It just wasn't as good as Embers of War for me. The space opera was mediocre for me. What I was really looking for was that horror element. It starts off with a bang. The first few pages, like there's a lot of blood and gore. And I wasn't necessarily looking for blood and gore, but it did shock me. And I like when something can shock me, but we get those first few pages of that. And then it sort of like just craters from there in terms of the sort of horrific and gory. There are horror elements throughout, but it really didn't scratch that itch for me. And number six is a good example of a book that I'm glad I read, even though it was a bit of a disappointment for me. And that was Light from Uncommon Stars. I did this as a buddy read with Erica from The Broken Spine. We read this and Goliath at the same time. Goliath was the superior read for me, but there was a lot to get out of this. Uh, character work was really interesting. Aoki presents characters like we've never seen before, uh, and then also characters like we have seen before. There's this one character, uh, I want to say her name is Shizuka Satomi, something like that. She's sort of like this Miranda Priestley, for those of you who have watched The Devil Wears Prada. She is like the Miranda Priestley of the violin world. 
she finds these uh, talented violinists, puts them on stage, turns them into stars, and she has the power to do this, especially because she's being helped by a demon. This is another one where I was expecting, this one I was actually expecting to be a lot more science fiction and not quite so fantastical. Demons are right up there with animated skeletons. Maybe not as bad as animated skeletons, but then the redeeming science, and I say redeeming just because I was looking for science fiction, not that I'm promoting science fiction over fantasy here. So the science fiction element is uh, Lan Tron, and she's this like starship captain from another galaxy. And so I guess she's the alien. She comes and she opens a donut shop and it's just a little bit hokey for me. There's a little bit of a romance between Lantron and another of the characters in the book. Did not scratch the science fiction itch, itch for me. But if you're looking for something with characters that you will care about, characters that don't fit the typical mold, themes of loneliness, acceptance, I really like what the author attempts to do with this book. It just didn't land right for me. Number five is Cibola Burn or Chibola Burn by James S.A. Corey, book number four in the Expanse series. So I did enjoy the Expanse series. The full series is great. I haven't read the final book that came out like a year ago because it's going to involve a full reread of the series for me to get there. And I did start my reread of the series and I stopped after I got to Cibola Burn. This one is, it's a little different than the books that precede it. We have uh, the same crew of the Rosinante, who are James Holden and others. We won't go into through the whole backstory here. Just if, if for those if, if, who, if you haven't read this, I don't want to spoil the book if you're going to go through the whole series. In Leviathan Wakes, we meet the main character, James Holden, and the crew of the Rosinante. Previously, they were the crew of this ice hauler called the Canterbury. It gets destroyed. So then they get caught up in this like inter-solar system conflict between the Earth... Mars and the belt. So the asteroid belt, those from the asteroid belt are known as the belters. So this is in our future, not like super, super far future. We have inhabited Mars, uh, the asteroid belt. So it's humans on Mars that we refer to as Martians. And there's this strange alien protomolecule they're trying to investigate and figure out. What's most interesting I think about this series are the politics and the conflict between the Earth, the Mars, and the asteroid belt, the balance of power there. This uh, entry into the series lacks a lot of that. We're very much bound on one planet. We're at this point where we're now outside of the solar system. There are different factions that are inhabiting this planet. There are, I believe, lithium stores here. There's some strange alien little creatures on the planet. These creatures are interesting at first glance, but other than that, there's not a whole lot to be excited about. I didn't dislike this read but it didn't compel me to go further into the series. It was very easy for me to step back and say, okay, that's enough of The Expanse for now. Give me a few months and I'll go back to it. It's been almost a year. I haven't gone back to the series yet. I think I probably will because I do want to get to that last book and I did really enjoy the series. This really lacked a lot of what made the series great in terms of, like I mentioned, the politics of the solar system. Number four is This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal el Notar and Max Gladstone. And it's interesting that this was written by two authors because it definitely feels like half the book was written by one person and the other half was written by someone else. The first half of the book feels like sort of a sci-fi young adult romance. You have these two agencies that are embroiled in this, I don't know, millennia's long conflict war. And their top agents for each are one is red and the other is blue. They are not necessarily cardinals or blue jays but the artwork on this is probably the best thing about the book for me. I do really enjoy this cover. What we have here though in the first part is these two agents are sort of leaving notes for each other back and forth in different areas and different spans of time. And it sort of buds into a romance. But again, like it feels, to me, it felt somewhat juvenile, not in a bad way. It just, it, it reminded me of how children or, you know, kids that are in sixth grade seventh grade, eighth grade, might engage in a pseudo romance. And that didn't work so much for me. In the second half, it gets very like sci-fi trippy. And I would say I preferred that. But even in that, I wasn't super compelled. And I should mention that in this conflict, one side is more sort of organic based and the other is tech based. So you can read into that some examinings of, you know, the organic and the natural versus the artificial world, and then apply that to time and space, 
that's sort of interesting. I would recommend this for those who are looking for something that is outside of the box in science fiction and maybe a little fantastical. I do know others who love this book, and while it wasn't a personal favorite of mine, I know at least three people who really like this, and one friend told me that this was their favorite book of all time. That doesn't mean that you're going to think it is, but it might be worth a shot. My number three most disappointing science fiction read is Beggars in Spain by Nancy Cress. This is another award-winning novel, uh, novella. I believe this one, the, it's a winner of the Nebula and, and the Hugo. It says it right there on the cover, if you don't believe me. This was also given to me by my friend Whitney at The Secret Sauce of Storycraft, along with Mountain in the Sea. So yes, I know it's unfortunate that I didn't love either of these books. I will say though that Whitney and I have read a lot of the same books and a lot of the same books at the same time. We both really liked uh, Foundation and the entire Foundation series, as well as some other books. But let's talk about this one. To me, this is sort of like Anne Rand light. Uh, definitely Cress pulls from objecti uh, Rand's objectivism and looks at, you know, what do the minority um, producers, like the strongest, the most successful, what do they owe to those who are not as productive. Those who are most successful in this world are successful because of bioengineering. So in this world, we have the ability to create babies that have no need to sleep. So these people, they grow up, never have to go to sleep. That means when you and I are sleeping, they can be out taking tennis lessons. They can be studying advanced calculus. They're going to have a much greater advantage in life than we are. So what happens when they become successful and the rest of us do not? doesn't mean there won't be, you know, the exception to this rule. So the ones that are going to be most successful in this world are the sleepless. What are they going to owe to the rest of us? The concept itself is kind of interesting, but like I said, this is very much Ayn Rand light. It presents the idea that, you know, hey, we've produced everything. Why should we be carrying these other people? But it doesn't ever get any deeper than that. The character work is, for me, really hollow, really empty. I don't care about any of these characters. And I also find that it's very monologue heavy. So there's a lot of showing us how smart and how successful these sleepless people are, but it's told to us. We never really see it, never really manifests in the story. So for me, this one was a bit of a fail. At number two is Clara and the Sun by Kazu Ishiguru. I've talked a lot about this book on the channel. So a lot of you probably already know what my issues are with this book. This attempts to be an examination of love, an examination of humanity, using artificial intelligence as a means to look at those things. And I've mentioned this before, when you do that, when you use artificial beings as a means to examine humanity, love, acceptance, the human condition, you are in league with Asimov, Zelazny, Bank, Dick. At least I'm adding some different names there, but there are so many authors, uh, Stanislaw Lem, Arthur C. Clarke, who have used AI or robots or the non-human as a means of looking at and examining humanity. This is not on par with the ideas that are raised in the novels by those giants of science fiction. What it is, though, is it's a really well-written book. The story's not great, but where it's a disappointment for me is in comparing it to other books that have tried to do the same thing. This is actually a lot like uh, Asimov's short story, Robbie, which appears in iRobot uh, that has a, a robot nanny. In here, we also have this robot sort of nanny artificial friend who is a friend for this sick child. The sick child, it, it, we're in this world where we have part of the population are sort of elevated and they have you know genetic advantage over others. So a little bit of parallel maybe there to Beggars in Spain, although very different stories. And we have, we're seeing the world through the, the eyes of this artificial friend. What's sort of frustrating though is this artificial friend, you know, she is this advanced robotics, but then she's referring to the manager as manager lady. We see this world through the eyes of this artificial robot and how she maybe perceives the world around her because she has very limited information because she's in a shop window for most of the time and she's just observing what's happening outside. At one point she sees, I think, a homeless man and his dog that appear to be dead. And then the sun shines and later on she sees them and they're, they're alive. So she assumes that, you know, the sun is this powerful being that has healed them. So she, when she eventually becomes the artificial friend of this sick kid, 
she's praying to the sun. So there's some religious connotation there. It's kind of interesting to look at, but it's just not a really solid story from somebody like Ishiguru who has uh, written such like just giant books in the, in the field. One of my favorites was Never Let Me Go, which is a highly philosophical book. This also fall, fell really short of that for me. I do have one honorable mention, and that's gonna be Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. I really didn't wanna put this on here because this is a really good book. It's a classic, and I know for some of you, this might be your favorite science fiction book of all time. It wasn't for me. When I first read this decades ago, I loved this book. So that's another reason why I don't wanna put it on here because it wasn't a disappointment for me then. I reread it a year or two ago, and that's where it was a little bit more disappointing, just because I've seen a lot of these ideas and other things, things that have come after this and has expanded on it, and I thought did a better job of it. So when I reread this, I had higher expectations that it was just gonna blow me away again. What is interesting is like there are like high philosophical ideas here about, you know, it's a unique aliens attack. They don't really attack us, but aliens come, uh, we have our first contact and what they do on the earth and how they interact with humans is very different than what we expect of an aliens attack story. And then there are really interesting implications for humanity and where humanity will evolve to. So this is a great story. I am gonna recommend this to those who haven't read it because it is a short read, it's an easy read. And if you haven't come across the ideas that are in this book, I think they still have the potential to blow your mind. Without further ado, my most disappointing read, number one on the list, is Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline. I have no problem saying that I really enjoyed Ready Player One. I thought it was a really fun book. No, it's not high literature. It's fun. It's something that the teenage gamer can read and just be completely captivated by. It's a book that, uh, you know, taps into the nostalgia of the 1980s for those of us who grew up in that time period. Where this will succeed, I think, is for the reader who loved Ready Player One and just wanted more time in that world. If you loved all of the, the worlds and the visuals and all the possibilities that existed in the virtual world of the Oasis, I still think this will be an enjoyable read uh, for those who don't have high expectations of high literature. And again, I think it's for the younger reader who is going to probably read this and say, oh, I enjoy this because it's that same universe. It just wasn't as good as the first one. Now, for me, it was a huge disappointment. I was expecting to have all the same kind of fun that I had in the first book, but really a lot of the ideas were just rehashed. The characters became less likable. They weren't super likable in the first one, but at least they were interesting because we were getting to know them. We got to see them having an adventure. And the biggest fail in this one for me was the forced nostalgia. There was forced nostalgia in the first book, but it was the first book and it was all novel. So I was fine with that. I was there for the ride. I was loving the references. It was great. This one, it's sort of like, okay, we used up all the really good references and all the significant and most uh, well-known references in the first book. So we had to like kind of scramble to get references. And some of the reference in, references in this were just really weak. And the biggest fail among those references was this battle scene with a bunch of different versions of Prince. That didn't work for me. This got heavily panned on YouTube, and I feel bad to be a part of the piling on because there is a place for this, and there is a reader that will enjoy this. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Everts, and this is Fit to be Read.